I'm, I'm Kyle. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Middesk. Uh, we like to say that we do background checks on businesses. I'll tell you more about what that means, obviously, in just a second. Uh, at a sort of a personal level, I spent the last four years working for a company called Checker. Rex mentioned that quickly. So Checker, we were building um, API for consumer identity and risk. So being used by companies like Uber, Lyft, uh, Amazon, et cetera. So great experience. I started, the team was four people uh, left in December. It's a team of about 300 people today. Um, so Kurt and I left to build Middesk. Uh, we went through the most recent Y Combinator batch uh, that just ended at the end of March. And uh, today our product's being used by companies like, like Checker uh, as well as Plaid when they onboard new accounts. So I'll spend some more time talking about what we're actually doing. So I think when I talk about background checks on businesses, people are like, oh, like what does that actually mean? So today um, we're really building what I would call like a business identity product. So to talk about the way background check on a person works for a second, just because I uh, learned a lot about that one over the last four years. So any background check kind of has two core components. So you have identity. So for a person, that means you need to know like what's their name? Uh, has that person ever had other names? You need to know their date of birth. You need to know where they've lived in the past. These are kind of all the core pieces of information you need to know about an individual. And then only once you have that information can you go and try to find criminal records for them. So that's kind of like, uh, that's the blueprint to starting a background check company if anybody uh, is interested in doing that. Um, <laughs> so for us, uh, we deal with a lot of very similar problems. So eventually our company will provide risk assessment of businesses. So risk for us will be about pulling uh, lawsuit records, bankruptcy filings, UCC filing information, uh, if there's active liens against the business. Uh, and these things are not just static, right? They change over time. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, but in order to get there, we need to build business identity. There isn't a very strong, veritable base of information that you can go out and pull about businesses. So we're effectively building the infrastructure now to answer questions like, you know, who, who is this business? What is the name of the business? Uh, have they ever had different names? Um, who are the owners of this company? And maybe have the owners of this company ever been associated with other businesses that we should know about? What states do we operate in? What's the sort of like footprint of the business? Uh, what industry does the company operate in? So these are all the things that we're working on today at Middesk. And there's obviously a lot to talk about here. So as opposed to kind of like talking about all of these things, uh, I'm just going to talk about one of these things. And so the one I'm going to talk about today is industry. So I'll just start with like a very simple question. It's like, what do you do? So as a person, like people are probably asked this all the time, maybe on a weekly basis. And so you can give a pretty quick answer to what do you do as an individual, right? Like I'm an engineer, I do sales, uh, I'm a doctor. Like largely you can understand what somebody does with just a few simple words. But what about for a business? What about for Square? So if you ask Square, what does Square do? Um, they might tell you they're a payment provider. They might tell you they're a hardware company. They might tell you that they're a loan provider. What they probably wouldn't tell you is that they're a software publisher. But a software publisher is actually what Square is classified as. So they're classified by this thing called NAICS. So for those of you that aren't familiar with NAICS, it stands for the North American Industry Classification System. So just a quick history lesson. Uh, industry classification started in the 30s, actually. So right in the middle of the Great Depression, the US is sort of trying to figure out like what is going on in the economy. And at the time, there was all sorts of census information. So you had census information about things like production and exports. You had census information about like employment trends, but you actually had no way to marry the two together. So they started this whole initiative to do, uh, at the time, what was called the Standard Industrial Classification, SIC code, SIC code. And uh, about 15-ish years ago, they moved from the SIC program to this new program, the NAICS program. So the way that it works is you have 20 broad categories, sectors of businesses. So a sector could be like uh, retail or manufacturing, government. These are at like the sector level. Within that, you have about 1,300 classifications of industries. And at this point, uh, there's now over 20,000 descriptions of companies that roll up into 1,300 categories that roll up into 20 different industry um, sectors. So that's kind of the way the classification system works. So the classification system is used like very regularly. So just a few examples. So payment processors will use industry classification to determine if merchants are high-risk businesses. And sometimes they won't work with them if they're high-risk. 
uh, or they might charge them sort of like higher fees for processing with them. If you're doing underwriting, so if you're underwriting somebody for an insurance policy, if you're underwriting them for a loan, understanding the industry they operate in really important. Let's talk about insurance. The insurance policy for a construction company that does roofing versus an electrician is like substantially different just because of the nature of their business. So understanding the business that they operate in is like very important. And then just one other kind of interesting one, um, the US Small Business Administration uses industry codes to classify businesses as small businesses, which is really important. The US government will give out contracts only for small businesses. And so you need to make sure your business is classified as the right thing. So there's really two ways that you can do industry classification today. So one way is you can let people do self-selection. So you can just like build a form and you can put a bunch of drop down things in the form and you onboard a business and you can just like hope they choose the right thing and maybe do some validation of it on the back end. And the challenge with that though is that you have to rely on the businesses to do the right thing and to know where they fall. I mean, it's hard. There's 1300 individual classifications of businesses. So it's hard to choose the right thing. Or you could use third party providers. So companies like Dun & Bradstreet, LexisNexis, like they've built these big historical data sets of business information. Um, and so you might be able to find a record there. We recently did a test with some of these providers to look at like how much coverage could we get. We had like 40% coverage gaps though on industry codes. So when you have those codes, you end up having an operations team behind the scenes to kind of like try to review websites and, and sort of like figure it out, fill in the gaps. So I thought we'd do kind of like a quick little game. You guys can play along if you want. So um, I pulled the industry codes for some companies. I thought this would be kind of interesting. So Coinbase, I'm assuming people generally know what Coinbase does. Uh, any guesses what industry Coinbase technically is in based on their industry code? Money lender, it's a good guess. Any other guesses? So Coinbase is actually a data processing company. That's what they're classified as. So talk about trying to understand the nature of Coinbase if this is what you think they do. Let's try another one. PAX, I don't know if you guys know PAX. So PAX makes devices to smoke cannabis. That's what they do. Any guesses what, what industry they fall into? <laughs> also data processing. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay, one, one more, one more. Pornhub, any guesses? Education? <laughs> Wired telecommunications carrier. I, I couldn't even make this up. I just I pulled these yesterday. This is, a, this is like accurate as of today. Um, anyway, so we, we, when we looked at this problem, we were like super excited about it, right? We're trying to go deep on all these like attributes of a business. And this is like, this is just a joke. Like it's, it's funny to put this up. So today, Funny timing, had to use the event for this. Today, we're launching a true industry product. Um, so we're launching it in beta. We'll do all the posts for it tomorrow morning. Um, so the idea here is like, we wanna help you guys, if you deal with businesses, we wanna help you classify your customers and to do it in like a fully automated fashion. So the way that our product works is we use largely the web presence of a business. Um, so we go out, for example, we can take all the content from the company's website, which could include all the text from their site, it could include images from their site. We look at the broader web presence, so we could look at their Yelp pages, and we can really build sort of this picture of the web presence of the entity. We take that content, we classify it, and then we can tell you if the business operates in sort of different types of industries. So this is something we're working on right now. So the way the first product is gonna work, um, and this will be available tomorrow, is you effectively have um, uh, two buckets of categories. You have high risk and prohibited industries, so things like adult services, uh, gambling, cannabis, virtual currency, investment and credit services, you guys can read. Um, and then, so the idea here is now companies can use our API, you onboard a client, and we can either give you an ability to quickly clear a business through where you don't actually have to spend any time looking at them, uh, or you send something to manual review and then a team can sort of spend time like digging a little bit more. So this is really just the starting point. Um, so over time, the goal, like we'll expand this product to get complete classification. So not just high risk industries, but really to be able to do a broad classification of every business. And what's really cool about this is like, um, we pull the data at the time the request is made. So what that means is we have the infrastructure in place to monitor these businesses. So let's say you have a um, tobacco shop and Stripe onboards a tobacco shop. And then six months later, um, new law goes into effect where the tobacco shop can sell weed. 
So we can keep watching these businesses. We can look for changes about their business and then notify our clients proactively if something changes about their business. So I pulled, you guys, it's probably a little hard to see, but just to kind of show you, like uh, we pulled these businesses before, and again, probably hard to see, but like effectively every um, one of the high risk industries gets uh, scored. So now Coinbase, we can tell you is a virtual currency company, Pax, we can tell you is a cannabis company, and Pornhub, we can tell you is an adult content company. And this is really based about the content that the business is actually building themselves. This isn't a self-selected thing. This isn't just based on a historical data set. This is like information we're pulling together at the time. So that's all I had to talk about. Um, if anybody is interested in like learning more about this, um, we're gonna release it tomorrow. So <laughs> um, you can certainly come talk to me, my co-founder Kurt and Will and Jason, they're here. Uh, that's our whole company right now, so feel free to <laughs> um, and come talk to us. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have about this or just like what we're working on in general or really whatever else. Or if you don't have any questions, that's also fine. No. <laughs> that's the end. <laughs>
And I mean that in, in the sense of like, when you're dealing just with individuals, you know it, it, you have a one-to-one -one relationship with that person. Starting at the entity level gives like a whole new concept of like developed information around the business. And you can really kind of build these like holistic risk profiles in the business. And, and that's what we're working on. Thanks for yeah. uh, I have no idea how your data is, data is structured, but you know, I, I imagine things like um, you know, doing background checks on companies is something that you know, journalists do or uh, Panama Papers kind of things. You find you know, interesting relationships between businesses that are associated with the same human being. Yeah. Obviously, I'm sure you haven't found any Panama Papers uh, <laughs> level stuff yet. Otherwise, you might be getting a different presentation. <laughs> but uh, have you found any sort of like you know odd edge cases yeah. or sort of interesting uh, not edge cases use cases or any sort of like like what's the coolest thing yeah. you've learned about companies <laughs> and their structures? I guess from going through. This? Oh, I mean, it's a mess. Like business structure is crazy. People will have a business. They start up as an LLC. They'll run it for a couple of years, shut it down, reopen it as a corporation business will fold and then you'll see them start another business two months later. I mean, it, you, like you see this stuff pretty regularly. Um, and so that's why we have to build kind of this like holistic picture of the business. You have people that move to different states and just reopen another business, but the old one went bankrupt in the previous state. There's, there's a lot there. And I mean, we have a lot to learn too. Um, we're doing our first pilot right now where we're effectively looking at fraud. Most of what we've been looking at has been, it's fairly kind of check the mark, like verification for onboarding purposes. Um, we're doing our per first pilot right now looking at like trying to identify fraudulent businesses. So an interesting thing I've seen there, this is just like yesterday. So um, you effectively look at 40 different business entities in a total pool of 100 companies. And we're trying to pick out the 40 fake ones. So things you start to see are you have a business entity who is set up where the address that they provide is actually a residential address, which isn't like crazy, that happens. But then when you actually when you own the whole data set of business records, you can start to query the data in ways you couldn't before. So when we take the address, you can look at all the other entities registered from the same address. And you start to see like 15 different businesses registered from one residential address, all created within a month of each other. Like that looks like fraud. So those, I mean, we're still learning a lot of this stuff, um, but that's just like one example of something that I just, I just saw that yesterday. Um, other things you see, just one other quick example, you see cases where like somebody operates a business, they run it for five years, they shut that business down. A year later, the same business looks to open back up again with a completely different list of officers. Somebody will find these businesses that shut down. If you sort of pull a, if you pull a LexisNexis report on them, Lexis just has a big old database of records. So it doesn't mean it's recent as of that day. And so you might see a case where a business that was shut down for a year they might look like they've had 15 years of history in business, but the reality is they shut down and then somebody else opened them up, called them the exact same thing. But when you look at it at the officer level, there's a completely different list of people. These are just like a couple of the things that we've seen and I'm sure there's many more things that I have not seen yet. But that's a couple of examples. Cool. Yeah, the, the beneficial owner piece, right, yeah. at the entity level uh, seems to be complex. It's getting, uh, it gets a lot of attention now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is the AML pieces, but um, what, what do you, how do you guys, how are you tackling that? That seems yeah. to be a really tough one. Yeah. Oh, oh, it is, it is hard. I don't think there's a silver bullet for it either. I mean, we, also just as a sort of side note, we're really focusing on the US right now, which makes this problem even harder. Um, and so today, the thing that we're working on to help people with UBO is generally the way people are solving UBO is again, you have a form and you like just hope people tell the truth. I don't know, that's kind of what, you, or you collect documents, which is very friction heavy. So what we're doing is we can use um, the officer information that we develop across all the different state registrations that we, that we source about the company. That can give us a list of officers. We can use information like crunch based data to pull in fundraising information. Um, we can use the web presence of the company. We can go to the website, we can scrape the website, pull all the individual's names off of it. And we can use that to supplement the officers list. We can build a list of people that we stack rank them. And we would say, if you have a list of disclosed UBOs, you should expect to see some of these people on this list. If you don't see some of these people, you should escalate that for manual review. That's how we're trying to work through it now. I don't think that's the right like long-term solution. It's not scalable. It, do, sorry, say that again. It's not scalable, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, all of that thing I just described, we can do in about 30 seconds. So it's not like, it's not a crazy like technical problem. But it's not, it's not going to get you to percentage of ownership. Um, 
And I, I don't know the, the way to solve percentage of ownership. That's, that's a really hard one. Like without asking for the documents, Carta has a pretty good data set, but it's like very limited. And I don't think they can start like giving it out. So um, I, I, I don't know like the perfect answer for that one, but I, that's at least how we've thought through it so far. Is, is the data that you're creating through uh, in the story and the distribution being is it accessible via APIs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, if you, if you want to play around with it, if anybody wants to play around with it, go crazy. I mean, like, it's certainly not perfect today. It'll get better with scale as we see more businesses. So really the goal right now, I mean, the way it works is we provide, you pass us a URL of a company, we'll return you about 30 seconds later, sort of a JSON that gives you like the top five things we think that a company might fall into with confidence scores for each one. And that's, yeah. So, and the top five would be effectively, we manage a list of high risk and prohibited industries. And then we have this huge category of non-prohibited. So that's kind of the way it works now. And then over time, as we see more businesses, we can get more and more granular with the classification. I think it was, yeah? So um, one thing that just struck me is there's clearly a lot of companies that don't necessarily want to know their customers. You know, we've seen this with things that happen Deutsche Bank and many other financial providers. Are, do you think there are certain sweet spots, certain industries where there's a high incentive to know your customers and so those may be better targets for you and others where, yeah, they want to know their customers to the extent that they yeah. comply with regs but they really don't yeah. want to know? Yeah, to totally. So, I mean, for the way I think about it is the people who are going to get the most value out of the product are the ones who have the most to lose. So if all the company is trying to do is just check the mark of compliance, they don't have much to lose until the regulators come and they find out that they weren't doing something correctly. Companies that have more to lose, uh, people who are doing underwriting of loans, that's like a much higher risk profile. If you give loans to a bunch of fraudulent companies, you, like, you are out the money. So those are, those are spaces where like, we've seen like, certainly interest. Um, I would love to be able to go to every B2B company and say, like, if you do self-service, you should use our product because you want to make sure you're not going to sign up some bad actor. I don't think we're quite there yet, but maybe at the point that you start doing risk and credit and you're talking to companies about the way they manage accounts receivable, that changes a little bit. But I think today it's really finding like where's the most risk at a transaction level. Um, and so far the, the most risk has largely been around companies that are doing underwriting for, for small business loans. Uh, especially if you're doing online lending where the scale is, you know, you're issuing 500, 1,000 loans a day. Um, that's, that, there's a lot of risk tied there. Yeah, so what if the company doesn't have enough digital footprints? So is it a risk for you or how you tackle it? Yeah. I mean, the, the more the better, right? Um, I think where people have trouble today, let's talk about a startup who's been in business for two weeks, right? There's not much. So most of the time, if you use like effectively any of the products that are in the industry today, they're not going to have any data about the businesses. And then you just end up falling back to an operations person. You have somebody that goes to the website and they try to figure out what the business does. So for us, like it's all about building the infrastructure to make sure the data is like recent, almost effectively as of that day. So we manage this whole data pipeline. Of, let's just talk about Secretary of State data. We manage a, a whole pipeline of Secretary of State data from all 50 states, make in Freedom of Information Act requests to get backfills. They'll send you CDs, like it's ridiculous. So that's the way we do it. And we try to keep the data recent, like at least up to the week. And so we can still pull records for businesses that have been in business for three days. If they're on file with the state, then we can guarantee we're going to have the records for them. And the reality is it's not all automated. Like we have some manual processing in the back to fill in the Delta companies that are a day old. Um, and that's just the reality of the business. You know, and when I think about using Checker again as the example, like it, it's not a completely automated thing. There's always going to be like a margin where there's people involved in the equation. And it's just trying to reduce that, that amount of human intervention as much as possible. Um, so that's the way we think about it. Like you're not just buying a data asset from us. You're buying more of like a, it's a service that's coming along with it. It's not just like a, a database of records. Awesome. Let's give it a